up, everybody? Welcome back to class. Okay, today I'm giving you some lecture notes, but we're doing it in a little bit different style from what I typically do. So no Google Slides or PowerPoint or anything today. You're not going to get a bunch of images. Uh, the upside to doing it this way, the information you see on the page here for on my screencast, that's basically the information you need to, need to know uh, and would want to probably enter in your notes or something close to that. Uh, now, why do we do notes again? Just kind of a quick refresher as we're getting into quarter four. Well, <clears throat> my class is largely based on lectures. Uh, the quizzes are a big part of your grade where we'll do typically like one quiz a week on average. And then also the exam is going to be 20% of your overall grade. I base basically every single one of my quiz questions and all of my exam questions off of my lectures. So I highly recommend you take notes. If you haven't been doing it to this up to this point in the year, now would be a great time to start up. Uh, and again, your notes only need to make sense to you. So don't think you're doing a better job at notes by writing more stuff. Honestly, I have found, and I think note taking is a great actual like practical real life skill that you'll be able to use and take with you into the real world. Um, Taking notes, ideally, they should be concise. They do not have to be complete sentences. I'd recommend you don't use complete sentences for this. And you just want like memory triggers or key phrases. So even everything that I have written down here, you can reword it. You could shuffle it around, change it a little bit, have it make sense to you because really you're the only one that's gonna be looking at your notes. I don't have you submit them for a grade, but quizzes and then eventually the exam are huge chunks of your grade. Uh, and typically those people that watch the lectures and those people that take the notes do much better. Uh, now you might be able to remember stuff for a quiz like the one we have coming up tomorrow uh, by just watching it and it might stay in your memory through the week. But a lot of this stuff will not be fresh in your memory when we take the semester two exam in June. So again, Take the take some notes. I think you remember it better if you just jot stuff down and you're actively participating when you are watching the videos and then don't throw them away when you're done. Hold on to them. They will come in handy at the end of the semester. OK, so you should already have a page of notes going for quarter four, a new page. And I explained that earlier this week when we watched the uh, or you would have watched the Division of Germany lecture. You are supposed to start a page of notes up titled The Cold War Era. Uh, we're also going to have a page that we're getting going next week called The Civil Rights Era. We will bounce back and forth between the two. This is going to be the last lecture I'm probably giving you for a little while, a week or so, uh, that will tie into the Cold War. All of the points that I have on this page, on this Google Doc that are in kind of bold black, those are key things that you'll want to know for the quiz or for the eventually the exam. So let's just start at the top of the list and go down. And if you're not clear where or what I'm talking about, I'll try to kind of move my cursor so that you see uh, exactly which one I'm talking about. Uh, now, you could just jot this stuff down and not listen to the video. However, I do give some supplemental information, and I'll kind of break it down and explain it a little better for the video. So the United Nations, that's something that's still around today. It's basically an international peacekeeping organization. Now, we tried doing this after World War I, something similar, a, a prototype version of it that was called the League of Nations. Um, the League of Nations was trying to <clears throat> keep world peace a place where all the big nations of the world could meet together and discuss problems and work out their differences. It didn't work so good because we had World War II break out and even bigger war 20 years after World War I. Uh, so this is like the United Nations, think of it as version two. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's League of Nations 2.0, essentially. Uh, now, the United Nations, this time the United States joins, which helps it be a little bit more successful. America did not join in the, in the first one, the League of Nations. But America does join after World War II as we're kind of taking a more leadership role in the world. Uh, the Soviet Union is also going to be in it, and a lot of the big European and Asian countries. Uh, today, pretty much every nation on Earth, most of them are, are members of the, of the United Nations, and it meets in New York City. So when you hear United Nations, it's still around today. It can kind of be controversial. Some people think it's a great idea. Other people 
don't like it and think it's kind of a worthless organization. Um, jury's kind of still out on it, on it, in my opinion, I guess. Uh, but the United Nations, I think the, the intent behind it is a good thing. It's basically an international peacekeeping organization. And like I put up here, uh, it, it has a very weak military. So it's not a strong military organization. Uh, that's one of the, the drawbacks and downfalls. Sometimes they'll say, well, this country's being aggressive and, and they should stop it. But they don't really have teeth to go in and enforce it. They rely on like America or China or Great Britain or France to go in and actually like kind of enforce their policies often more. Uh, but the good thing about it is it is a safe place where countries can send their representatives in and discuss problems and try to work out their differences. Now, going back to the post-World War II era, uh, you had, you know, World War II really kind of restructures the balance of power in the world. That's why I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, now, Nazi Germany has been defeated and Imperial Japan. But what you have emerging from the ashes of of World War II are two really big global superpowers that, you know, at one time were allies, but almost as soon as the dust settles, they start locking horns and squaring off. And you have the United States and the Soviet Union becoming arch enemies. All right. That's kind of a big theme of the Cold War era, uh, that these two countries have a very icy relationship and don't like each other. Well, each side starts to build up a coalition. Like think of it like a team of all of their allies and everybody that's on their side. So America's team, all of our friendly countries right after World War II, it's going to be called NATO. This organization is still around today. It stands for, and you wouldn't need to put this in, but you could if you wanted, it's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So like America's in it, any country that's around the North Atlantic that is basically a democracy or a republic uh, and is on friendly terms with America really was kind of invited to join this. So for example, Canada is by the North Atlantic. They're a NATO member. Uh, Great Britain, France, West Germany was a NATO member. Now, East Germany was not because they were a communist country uh, and they were over on like Russia's side, right? So Russia sees this happen. They see America build up this alliance and they feel threatened by it. So they basically do the exact same thing and they make up a team of all of the, the communist countries or these satellite nations that they're dominating and kind of telling them what to do. And their alliance is going to be called the Warsaw Pact. Warsaw was like the capital city in Poland. Remember, Warsaw, or, or what was happening with Poland was a very controversial thing. That was like the biggest issue at the Yalta conference when FDR and Stalin and Churchill all meet was, well, they were deciding what to do with Germany, uh, how we're going to defeat Japan. But they also, the biggest issue there was what's going to be the future of Poland? Because Poland had always been a democracy. They wanted to be on America's side, but the Russian army had come through and Stalin never pulls his troops out. Uh, so Poland is going to be stuck through the Cold War era being a communist nation, kind of against their will. That's not what a majority of the Polish people would have wanted. Uh, but anyway, they base it out of there. Uh, so uh, the Warsaw Pact is kind of like that was a key Soviet spot where a big city that they would go meet in. All right, moving on now, the Truman Doctrine. Harry Truman is the guy that becomes president after FDR dies right at the very end of World War II. So right before Nazi Germany was defeated, uh, we, we basically were wrapping up the war over there. FDR has an aneurysm. He had been in poor health for a while, kind of unexpectedly dies. It shocks the country. Now, remember, Harry Truman, he was in a difficult position. He had now... FDR had been president longer than anybody else before or since. He's the only person that's ever been elected to four terms as president. We changed the rules after he dies, and now you can only do two terms as president. Uh, but FDR had been elected four times. He dies early in his fourth term. Now, you would think if, if he had had the same vice president through the whole time, that guy should be ready to go. He would have been included on a lot of the decisions. He'd be up to speed on it all. Uh, but actually, for his first three terms... He had, FDR had a different vice president, and then there was a scandal kind of happened, and that guy had to resign. So Harry Truman had only been uh, vice president for about a year just for FDR's fourth term, and then FDR unexpectedly dies, and he gets thrown into wrapping up World War II and kind of the chaotic situation that's going to unfold after World War II when we get worried that the communists, the Soviet Union, are going to try to basically take over the world and spread communism everywhere. Uh, so Harry Truman is a very 
very uh, important speech, one of the most important presidential speeches probably in American history, uh, and it's known as the Truman Doctrine. Basically, in this speech before Congress, he basically pledges that America is going to take a leadership role in the world, that we are going to try to protect the world from communism. Uh, now, some key things that he sets down in the Truman Doctrine that kind of become American foreign policy moving forward, uh, not just for the rest of Harry Truman's time as president, but for many presidents after him for decades to come. One of the big ones is containment. Uh, now, this is something that you should have wrote down in yesterday's book notes. If you've already have a good definition for containment, well, hey, you don't have to rewrite it down again. Uh, and I should have mentioned that at the beginning. I think NATO, Warsaw Pact, a lot of those things were also uh, were vocab for the the notes assignment you did yesterday where you were looking at the text. You don't have to rewrite down definitions, but when I give an explanation of them here in this video, you might want to tack a little information information on if I cover it or explain it in a slightly different way. So the American policy of containment during the Cold War is actually, it's named pretty well. It's just what it sounds like. We are trying to contain communism where it's at. And he says this in the Truman Doctrine that we're going to stop the spread of communism. So, so what does that mean for like a country like Poland? Poland before the war, before World War II, had been on our side. We want Poland to be a democracy again. We would love them to be a member of NATO. Uh, but we know the only way to go in and like liberate Poland and make them a democracy, we would have to go in there and fight Russian troops. And that will likely break out World War III. Well, Truman, nobody was ready for another big war to break out. So Truman basically says places like Poland, Sorry, tough luck. You're just kind of lost to the other team. Uh, we're not going to go and try to like free countries from communist oppression. But what we will do and we are willing to fight for is if the Russians are trying to spread it to any new areas, America has your back and America will come in and fight on your behalf. So like the Soviet Union, for example, maybe they could take out a country like like Austria or like Italy, okay, smaller European nations. The Soviets could have dropped the hammer on them and got them. Uh, but when America says, hey, we will go in and fight right alongside them, then the Soviet Union has to think twice about going in and trying to take over areas like that because America is a big superpower and has a great military. Uh, so the, you get this Cold War, this tension starting to build uh, where America and really the Soviet Union has a similar policy uh, where they were ready to fight for any places that we try to go in and liberate. So containment, basically just what it sounds like. We're trying to contain communism where it exists at the time of that speech. And we're going to do everything we can up to going to a war uh, to stop it from spreading to new areas. All right. So containment is American policy during the Cold War. And it all kind of starts up and has its roots back in the Truman Doctrine, uh, where America is pledging, we're going to take a leadership role. We're going to be the lead like democracy in the world. Now, the Marshall Plan, this will be a really quick one. Well, well, I, I, some of you watched the story I did my on my grandfather's World War II experiences. One of my grandfathers was in the infantry and was a machine gunner. The other one was on a B-17 bomber crew. And, you know, guys like my grandpa flew lots of missions, dropping bombs on many German cities. Uh, also, cities in France and Poland and kind of all over Europe had been bombed out. Uh, it looks like a wasteland. You look at some of the, the photos of German cities after World War II, like in 1945 at the end of the war, man, it looks like something out of a zombie apocalypse. Everything's bombed out and desolate. Um, that's a big problem. Europe has been bombed back into the Stone Age, many parts of Europe anyway. Uh, so uh, what are we going to do from here? Uh, it's a mess over there. And a lot of those countries in Europe, their economies are a mess and they don't have a lot of money. So America uh, unveils or, or kind of rolls out the Marshall Plan. Uh, General George Marshall was one of, he was the like the top secretary, uh, which sounds like a secretary, like not like doing work kind of thing or, or, or answering phone calls. Uh, but he was like a, one of the highest ranking generals in the U.S. military. Um he was the chief of staff. Yeah. And I think eventually he became a, a secretary of defense, I think. Uh, anyway, that's not really important. But that's what I do want you to know is this plan gets General Marshall's name. It's the Marshall Plan. And essentially what it is, we are going to give billions of dollars to in loans 
to European countries that are on our side. So we're not going to give loans to like Poland because Russia is dominating Poland right now. East Germany, that's kind of like Russian territory too, and it's a communist nation. Uh, But West Germany or France or Belgium, those places that had been bombed out, but now are going to be kind of like on our team, we'll give them pretty much unlimited money to start rebuilding their cities. Uh, Today, if you go to Germany today, I was there about 20 years ago. It is very modern. All of their cities look really modern and new and skyscrapers. And a big part of that is where, because in other European countries, you go to Italy or go to Greece, you'll see these really, really old historic like stone buildings. Well, they don't exist in Germany because they all got bombed to smithereens in 1943, 44, 45. Uh, In German cities, essentially, pretty much all the buildings in them have all been built from 1945 on through to today. So it's a, a very modern country. And anyway, the Marshall Plan helps Europe get back on its feet. It's our way of helping out our allies and making them stronger so that down the road, they actually will be allies more co-equal with us and be able to help us out. too. That'll help get our economy rolling again. So massive loans, billions of dollars of loans uh, that we're going to Western European countries. The Western part of Europe is, is more like the American side, the, the side that would have democracies and have elections. Uh, China. Now, this is a big issue. I think I'm going to hit into this a little bit more. This is something that I think it haunts us on through to today because, you know, you fast forward to modern day, China is America's biggest rival now. Uh, a lot of people have said there is a new Cold War that has started up between the United States and China, where we we aren't going to like really going to go into a hot war with each other and fight each other, uh, but we have a very tense relationship and we have very different goals and a very different kind of a culture and system of government. All right. So this all kind of goes off the rails and goes away. We don't like back in 1949, about four years after World War II ended, China had been was a hot mess for at least 10 years or more before that. Remember, Japan had put, made China part of its empire. And not all of modern day China, but huge chunks where most of the people live had been conquered by the Japanese army. Uh, when Japan falls, we drop the atomic bombs on them and World War II is over. Things are extremely chaotic in China. Millions of people have been have starved to death and have been killed. And there are competing groups in China that are trying to take control of, of the country uh, and build up a new government that will replace the, the old regime that has like just kind of crumbled apart and been long gone. Uh, so you have two major factions that are fighting for control of what is going to become modern day China. You have, and this is a important, name here that you should write in. You have Mao Zedong. He is commonly known as Chairman Mao. He is the communist guy. All right. So associate Chairman Mao as he's the communist. And then you have Chang Jishi, or sometimes I'll hear it pronounced like not with a J, but a C-H, like Chang, Chang Jishi. Uh, G- Chang is the American guy. He's more friendly with us. I don't want to say he would fit in totally here in America and have all the same ideals as us, but he was not communist. And that was good enough for us. He was more friendly to America. Well, a civil war plays out and Mao and the communists end up winning. So in 1949, China proper, the big part of China where most of the people live, becomes a communist nation. And even though back at this time, China was not a powerhouse, uh, it didn't really have a lot of factories. It was a very poor agrarian society. Pretty much everybody was poor farmers that was living there back in 1949. Um, It still, though, despite that, it doesn't look good. It makes President Truman look kind of weak on communism. Uh, You know, and Truman had just won a very close reelection because that had been he finished out FDR's term where he was vice president. And then he gets elected to a a second term for him. Uh, If this had happened before the election, he almost certainly would have lost the election because it didn't look good. It was kind of a black eye for Truman. And it was like, hey, man, what about containment? We're supposed to not let communism spread in And then it just spread into this massive country. Now, China was very poor back at the time, didn't have a great military, but they still had a huge population. So think about that. In 1949, this revolution plays out in a civil war. And then, bam, it feels like overnight, a quarter of the world's population 
goes over to the enemy side. They go over to like the, the side of the Soviet Union. Now, we were worried that the Soviet Union, Russia and China would start working really close together. Actually, they don't agree on a lot of things and they kind of have their own separate version of communism. Um, but still, they're both communist nations. That doesn't look good. We're pretty upset about it. Now, Yang Jishi does not get killed or executed. He loses the civil war and he's actually able to retreat with a lot of his army and supporters. And they go to another place you may have heard of called Taiwan. Taiwan is a little island in the South China Sea. Uh, and that's going to be free China. And today it is kind of, even to this point, kind of quasi-independent. Like China still claims it today and says it's part of part of China, uh, but yet they kind of have their own system of rules and laws and, and you would be more free if you lived in Taiwan today. But Taiwan is a very tiny little island. Uh, so that was a huge blow, losing the whole mainland part of China to the communists. Doesn't look good. A lot of Americans are upset about that. And then I think that leads into our final point today, which is paranoia. You know what paranoia is? It's like where you're you're worried and looking behind your back and you're nervous. Well, the Cold War is now heating up. We feel like Russian spies are everywhere. Uh, we are very paranoid that communists are going to come in and try to infiltrate the United States. Uh, they're outside enemies, all right? So like today, maybe the closest thing I could ca compare it to would be like, but like terrorists or Islamic extremist groups, all right? Uh, you know, back before this era, it was the Nazis. We were really worried about them. Uh, well, if you look at really any point in American history, there almost always is an enemy, a bad guy that the people are scared of. The, it's easier for a government and politicians to kind of manipulate the people and get them to do what they want and mobilize them if we think we have a common enemy. So you go back to colonial times, it was like the Native Americans, the Indians, they're going to scalp you. That was like our perceived enemy. And then it's Great Britain. Uh, and then it's going to be Germany in World War One, and kind of Germany again in World War Two. Well, by this point in history, it's the communists. It's the Soviets. Soviets. And uh, we are very, very worried and paranoid. And average American people are really kind of freaking out about this. And it actually starts to affect just regular American culture, too. It's not just at the governmental level, but it seeps in and permeates life in America. Uh, and to give you a point, of kind of what I'm talking about here, this is another very key term you should definitely highlight for your notes. Uh, it even affects Hollywood in movies and music, where a lot of Hollywood actors are accused of being communists. If now, Technically, being a communist in America, that's not illegal. We have the First Amendment and freedom of speech and expression. Um, you could be a Nazi. You could be a communist. It, it's, it's not illegal. You can be part of any political party and say what you want here in America, which is a great thing. How many people were openly Nazis back then or even today? How many people would want to say, I'm a communist, when basically the whole country agrees Communists are our enemies. It, not a very popular viewpoint, even though it's technically not illegal. Uh, but today you'll hear things maybe in the if you're paying attention to the news where people talk about cancel culture, where somebody says the wrong thing or does the wrong thing and then they get fired from their job. Well, there, there was definitely some cancel culture stuff going on back in the 1950s, too, in the late 40s, where a lot of times... Hollywood actors, whether they actually were a communist or most of them were not communists at all, uh, but even if they just got accused of being a communist, many of them got blacklisted. Uh, so there's that term I was telling you to highlight and write down. If you are blacklisted, essentially that means you've been accused of being a communist in this case. And it's like, it's not illegal, but nobody will hire you. You lose your career, you lose your job, you're a pariah, which means like an outcast, a hated one. Uh, and this happens to a lot of famous people. It also happens to uh, some government officials and everything. I mean, it would be one of the worst things back in this era, accused of being a communist and have other people believe that. It totally made you an outcast. Okay, hopefully all this stuff made sense. I'm curious if you like notes this way or if you prefer the slides. So, so if you'd like to give me a little bit of feedback, tell me what you think, which style you prefer. Better. I will probably do a little bit of both moving forward for quarter four. Uh, and then after this, forget to check into the quiz and complete that. Uh, the quiz is based off of all the lectures I've done this week, including this one. Take care. Have a great weekend.